Okay, we're in business. Okay, morning everybody, let's make a start. Before I go on to the main topic of the day, can you get into your course resources pages? Because I want to just give you a little, show you a bit of admin in terms of the program management and arranging the program, some information about the program, the SAIT program, I want to point out to you. So, if you can get into your course resources pages, uh, you'll need to load a lecture slides up in a minute, but just go into your course resources pages and you should get some kind of screen like this, hopefully. Uh, can you see a title that says something like BSC Bachelor of Science Information Technology link? Can you see that link? Yes. Yes, okay. So if you go in there, what I'm trying to do as program leader of the BSC IT is to use this area as a general source of information for you. Um, so instead of emailing me saying where do I find this and where do I find that and find the other, you can actually find it in here. So if we go into that section, you'll see that on the top of the list is a student absence notification. Can you see that? Okay, we are actually at the moment running through, checking through attendance records of students and leaning on the ones that haven't been coming. So if you are away for any, any reason in terms of illness or absence or beyond your reasonable control, then please do let the university know officially through this link. Okay, don't send me an email. Go through this link and it will record it officially on your student profile um, so that when we go into your profile we can see you've had a period of absence. Okay. So it's just important that if you are away from university for a week or more, for illness or some, some other reason, um, reasonable reason, then please do tell us, tell the university officially using this, this link here through to the university web pages. Because at the minute, as I say, we are checking through attendance records and leaning on one or two students. The other thing that I want to point out to you are the term dates. One of the students have been asking me about term dates. So I'll put a list of term dates up here um, with semester one. Um, so last day of teaching is a week on Friday. Uh, I don't think we've got any formal exams, but it's 4th to 12th. Then we start again on the 18th. Teaching starts again on the 18th. Um, and then ends on the 22nd. And then we've got an exam period again, which I don't think affects you. Do we have exams? Not that I know of in any of the modules. Not that I know of. I don't think so. But your module leaders will, will tell you when you do the modules. But as far as I'm aware, I can't think of a, a module that has a formal written exam on the IT program. There might be tests and online tests and things, but as far as I remember, there's no formal um, written exams. So again, I just want to point out to you as well the term dates. And if we go down further, there are some program management notices there. I'm program leader, as, as we've got here. And I'm year tutor for year one. For year three, final year, your year tutor, your year tutor is Richard Self here. And he's also your personal tutor. <coughs> so um, this is again um, just to record that information with you. We need a couple of student reps as well from the final year. I think Richard's capacity on Monday, perhaps. So we still need some student reps. So I've got some for the first and second years, but I can still do with some student reps for final year as well. So please do use this part of course resources, general program information for recording of absences, checking term dates, and also just checking on some program management issues like personal tutoring and um, year tutors kind of stuff. Now, I've also put an assessment, well, started to put an assessment schedule up. If you just go into that for a second, you will see what I've done in there is put links in to the um, put links into your modules. So when you click on, say, uh, the Virgin IT Pro Development, which is this module, it can take you through to the assessment section. So then you can pick up your dates of assessments from there. So you've got one place, if you like, where you can find, you can put links to your assessments. So you can, you can work out your dates and do some forward planning managing your time a little bit better, so you've got the dates of assignments in there. Okay. 
is that is that okay? So I'm trying to put information on that program notice so that you don't have to keep emailing everybody saying when do we start teaching again and how do I record my absence? Okay, who was my year tutor? Okay, it's all up there on that uh, on those pages. Any particular questions about that arrangement? Yeah, I'll only say, as, as a IT person interested in user-centered system design, I'm trying to make sure that the way we use the IT is, uh, is um, useful and usable and helps you get on with what you need to find out. Okay. Let's move on to the topic of the day then. Oh, actually, I do want to go into the... Uh, if you can go into your module course resources pages for this module then now. Probably the easiest way of doing that is to go into assessments and then figure it from there. <coughs> so yeah, I've just got some new stuff up there now already. For okay, so again, just a reminder about the way I'm trying to you're trying to set these pages up so that you've got a folder per week, and inside each folder is the material that we've used in that week. Um, so we've got, this week is week 11 storytelling, next week we're just having an open session, I think, briefing on assignments, no formal. Yeah, not a sort of think about it, yeah. yeah. See how not, not a formal presentation lecture stuff, but, um, and then hopefully on the 10th, I'm arranging for, for um, Ross to come back again. But I do need to know whether we are going to have anybody come to that, because if nobody's interested, then obviously I'm not going to arrange it. So I do need to know by the end of this session today, I think, and there's only three of them, who is likely to be coming. Because otherwise, there's no point in, the, there's no point in asking him when nobody turns up. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll clarify that as we go through the session. Um, okay, so the other thing about today is that I'm going up to Sheffield this afternoon to a SAS meeting. So we'll finish about half 12, so give me time to get on the train and go up to Sheffield. So we'll hope to finish by half twelve with the latest hour this morning. Um, okay. Um, do you want to take over from there for five minutes, yeah, Richard? Yeah. And set the scene, and then I'll do my bit. Yeah. Yeah. Is running? Is it live? Sorry? Is that running? It says yes. It's good. Okay, if you have a look in the, um, course, the assessment section, you'll see here the, um, the two or three little documents. One is the specification of the task itself, uh, and then there's some ex a couple of extra items about a framework called the Skills for the Information Age, SOFIA. And the reason I put these here is because we're using some of the SOFIA uh, criteria uh, to, as like, the basis of our assessment of what you're doing, particularly on the presentational side. Uh, and I'll just take you through briefly uh, the task you know about. We've been talking about the task, and it's find an interesting set of data, open source of data, think about the data kind principles and approaches to find the interesting projects which can help organizations or people or communities. And there are three or four sections there that are based around the normal sorts of criteria. But the SOFIA ones we're using to give you 20% um, of the, the grade relating to the quality and approach you take in actually constructing that presentation that you're going to submit um, early in January when you've done the project and you're thinking about what went well and why, what didn't go so well and why, and, and so on. And we, want to, and we want to help you to develop the skills in terms of your presentation so that you really are very, very effective when you go back into your job or when you get to a job. So you can actually leap, sort of jump start your career rather than being a sort of a, a very junior staff member who doesn't really have any presentational skills and so on. And so that's what we're going to be doing. And Zafir is a clever framework created by the British Computer Society 
and is used in industry as part of continuous pre professional development. It's used for in many organisations in the IT uh, departments as the, one of the bases, bases um, upon which they assess individuals' contribution to the, the projects, to the work they're doing. And it also is usable by individuals to help develop, to work out um, or to support their conti continuous professional development activity by providing a list of quite a, f a large number of technical capabilities and criteria that they put down the left-hand side of the matrix and across the top, um, seven levels of, of competence that from sort of a follower, someone who is very, very junior, sort of te a technician kind of level who is supervised all the time and given very clear work schedules and so on, right through to the far end, uh, number seven, which is kind of basically your chief information officer level of leading, setting strategy, inspiring, all those sort of things. And so, let, first of all, let's just have a look at the assignment itself. draft of it. Um, now, the deliverables of the project are the, so there's two parts. The first part is the technical challenge, finding the data, sort of putting it into Bluemix, doing things with, with it in Bluemix, analyzing it, and getting your uh, insights, the things that are really, really important. The sort of things that you will do for, as an analytics expert You'll be given a back of a fag packet uh, type of specification. We think you want to have a look at these sort of things, and we hope will be the sort of um, comment will come from your customer, perhaps a, uh, a marketeer, or it might be an inventory management specialist, or it might be um, someone looking after uh, the supply chain. Whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm thinking about your job. And they'll just say, here's a set of data, um, or maybe even, this is a sort of problem we have, we'd like you to go find the data, we'd like you to do the analysis, and then come and tell us what it means. And so, you, you will do these sort of tasks as part of the natural job of being someone who does analysis of data, analytics. So you've got to find a source, you know about it. From that data, you find an interesting problem. Um, in the real world, you'll have been given the problem, but then you need to find that. Um, then you, what, what we want you to do is, to, and you may want to do it formally with a small requirement specification document, just so that you know what you're doing. But we're not assessing it for that requirement spec. But you may find it useful to do that, just to help you keep on track. Um, <coughs> you also need in there to be actually justify why you've chosen the problem and why you've cho chosen this particular approach. Um, again, to help you keep on track. You might then you need to load the data, you might need to do some cleansing of the data, you might need to sort of see where there's problems with the uh, veracity of the data, thinking of those 14 Vs to help you think about the important questions as you get the data together. And then you just do the analysis work, the analytics. And out of it will come, hopefully, some interesting insights. I.e., what is it I've learned by doing this analysis that actually is going to make a difference to someone or to some group of people or organisations? That's the task, the sort of thing you would do as a real analytics expert. But we're not going to mark that. What we are going to mark is a presentation. And this is the sort of presentation you would give to your customer when you've done all the work and you're going back to them and saying, right, this is the project you gave me, or in this case, this is the project I've chosen because, da -da -da -da. and then you will take them through what you did, how it went, and what's come out of it. So, the first little bit of your presentation, which is going to be 15 minutes plus or minus one minute, so it's going to be really tight, it's between 14 minutes and 16 minutes. 
And if it is either shorter or longer than that, you're going to lose some marks. You're going to lose 10, 10 marks out of your total uh, marks for the whole um, assessment. So you'll spend a bit of time, 20% of the time probably, on that requirement spec. You know, why have I done it? Justify the, 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 the project. And you know, so why is it, why are you doing this project? And uh, what needs to be done inside the analysis aspect? The second chunk for 20% is a sort of reflection on the way you designed it and developed it and then actually put it all together. And then for 40%, you're going to be talking, talking to the, the um, clients, me and Dennis, about four different aspects, 10% basically for each of them, and then overall 40% from the insights gained. Now, what and the four areas we want you to think about are one, the technical challenges of using Bluemix, of making the data flow from beginning to end, and a little bit, 10% uh, looking at the data sourcing and cleansing and loading and integration, connecting different databases together or data sets together. A bit on the analytic insights, and what, what came out of this analysis, what made it so valuable, why is it great? And then a short section on how you've embedded the principles of uh, the data, um, the data for humanity principles, which are listed up a little bit higher up. And it, this presentation is a reflection, a critical reflection, so not a description. I don't want you to say, I did this, I did that, I did the other, and this is what happened. It's very much cast in the what went well, and the majority of it. I mean, in terms of the requirements, spec, and justification, obviously that's not a, what went well and what didn't go so well, but it's, this is why I'm doing it. But the rest of it is really very much, I tried to do it this way because, and it was successful because, or it wasn't so successful because, and what I would do better next time. And what we're doing here is very, very much um, duplicating is a sort of approach to a presentation you will give to your client after you've done the work they've asked you to do, and you're delivering, this is how we did it, this is why it went well, and here are the answers you were looking for. So we're trying to get it very, very closely aligned to what you'll be doing in the real world. So it's very, very much focused on employability making you fit for employment, making you able to jumpstart your career, able to jump ahead of many of your colleagues who will be coming in at your level as, opposed, as a graduates who won't have had this sort of experience. So this is what we're trying to do, is make, make your abilities much, much more valuable to your employers. And we, I'll, I'll take you through the criteria in a minute, but you will find these uh, links very, very important. You are strongly encouraged to sign up um, at the Sophia uh, website as a personal account. You'll get access to the entire Sophia framework uh, and lots and lots and lots of resources including um, the ability to run a small com uh, con continuous professional development um, data set for yourself where you can audit your capabilities and plan to improve them Think about training courses, think about using your remaining modules here uh, in the university over the, the last th few months you've got to really acquire yet more skills. And what I, we would like to do is, with your permission, any of your presentations which come 70% or above, we will be able to publish them on one of our websites for other people to see. So you'll actually be able to link on your CV to your own presentation. To say, this is the quality of presentation that I can give that will actually demonstrate why I'm much better than everybody else around me who's applying for the job. So what we've got, four columns as usual, well, four pres uh, assess columns with the criteria, the usual 95%, 85%, 75 and so on boundaries. So those are the three sections I talked about earlier on. 
the requirement spec justification of the project, the design, development, and implementation, and then the insights in terms of technical data, analytical, and the principles type of side. Now, what's important about the Sophia and why you should get hold of it and why you should look at the little introductory presentation that's um, the third item down, I think it is, on the assessments folder, is you will be able to get an understanding of how the, this part actually relates to it. And so we're giving two different types of criteria in terms of where of how you can judge the quality, how we can judge the quality and, and provide equivalence to other places. Um, if, if it's a really good presentation, the sort of presentation I would expect to see presented commercially by um, senior execs and senior managers in commercial conferences, that's what I'm looking at here, the sort of stuff I was looking at um, watching a couple of three weeks ago. But it's also, um, you know, you're really looking at strategic and inspirational issues in the way that you present it. You're really inspiring your client and their, the client's team that this is a fabulous opportunity that they've got from the data. And if we look down a bit lower, uh, level six, you know, in it, we're developing the ability to create, uh, start it off our own bat, a project, and then we can influence the way things are going. Uh, it's done, capable of being presented at national uh, work, academic workshops, national um, conferences. And then at level five, this is the enabling and advising, sort of, kind of, sort of middle management levels, um, enabling, advising, um, and, or in academic terms, suitable for a university research forum. The sort of things we do fairly regularly uh, with universities. And yes, you'll see also other things like emerging topic areas, um, a novelty coming in. And then when we get down to 65%, this is a sort of level that a, a second year business analyst is out there that's just graduated, has been working as a trainee business analyst for a year, and is now the next level up, being promoted to business analyst. That's the sort of quality that they would tend to expect there. Basically fairly competent, um, and the sort of thing that I would hope that all of you could do uh, as you go out there, work at least a grade ahead of where most of your um, com competitors will be who just graduated. And then if we get down to the um, lower, lowest level of pass, the 45% band, well, that's the sort of thing that ordinary graduates going straight into a business analyst, a training business analyst uh, role would probably be able to do with quite a bit of coaching, quite a bit of help from the management of supervision. So we're trying to sort of set this one very much against stunning capability as a graduate going into business. The other, th other three columns, well, you've seen those already uh, in terms of the uh, criteria for st strategic uh, SI, um, SI, um, sustainable information corporate governance module, the other one you're doing at the moment. So they've got this sort of argument quality here. So you're familiar with those. Um, and they're just the same sort of thing there. So what you'll do, you'll put together this reflective presentation. You will provide a voiceover. So if you go into PowerPoint, um, and I've given you the link or the, the um, controls to go through to add a voiceover. So you will project, create your presentation. You might want to put one or two screenshots in. It's up to you how you actually um, build that presentation. And then using the add the adding the uh, commentary, which means you just got to plug a, um, a microphone into your, into your PC so the PowerPoint can pick it up and then you time it and all those sort of things. And then when you finish that, you will then submit it to the submission point uh, on the fourth evening or the fourth of, um, of January. And then after that, Dennis and I will pick them up and we'll go through them and we'll assess them and give you the feedback. Uh, in the usual sort of fashion. Uh, I'm 
have a couple of questions. Yeah. First question is uh, the presentation can be only slides. I don't have to like do a video on me. No, 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 no video at all. It's purely PowerPoint. Okay. And the second question: Do you expect to see a working presentation on the on the ninth? No, because you won't have a chance to get there at the moment. Because uh, you've probably hardly done much in the Bluemix side. By the way, have you actually tested out your Bluemix codes yet? Yeah. They work now. Brilliant. Excellent. That's, that's a relief. Uh, so now, basically, you get on with it. And I mean, you've had plenty of formative feedback in this module and the Sustainable Information Corporate Governance. So you know how we're thinking, how to use these criteria to drive yourself up to the highest levels. Sorry? Uh, will be the submission for uh, emergency yeah. and, uh, government assignment on the same day? Well, yeah, they are, the same day. Um, but then we've already had the feedback on SINCG, so that should be, you should be capable of finishing that up pretty quickly. Um, so the fourth, tr unless, we, unless we discover that we need to move it another week because of the lateness of getting your codes working with Bluemix, then Assume the fourth, and uh, unless we, we let you know. We'll have to see how it goes. Um, we have to give you enough time to get used to it. What will we uh, do on uh, 9th of December? Review. The, the 9th and 10th, that's, uh, that's next week, so that's Wednesday and hopefully Thursday, if enough people what will be coming, and we need to get, find out where everybody is. And hope and hopefully they'll come so we can get Ross to come. We're really, it would be really nice to have Ross here yeah. to give you sort of help to help you in sort of an individual bit of work. That's the aim. Um, but if only three or four people are here, it's hardly worth Ross coming 250 miles up the motorways. Could be an email to the whole class. Well, I've already put one out, but we'll put another one out as well and shout at them vigorously. Because I'm, I'm agreeing to come up. On the I thought it was on this Thursday. Did I accept that? I can't. No, you can or can't? No, I can. You can next yeah, Thursday. Okay. Can come. So, can the four of you come next Thursday if yeah. uh, we would like? Yeah. Okay, so at least four we know. So, we'll see if we can get a few more and then uh, confirm with Ross to come if possible. Does this make sense the way we're setting out the assignment here? Uh, Do you understand so the criteria know. by and large? So I mean, about three sections. Pardon? I mean, three sections in grading. Uh, one, uh, the one. Uh, I, I mean, I understand the last uh, part. Yeah. But uh, pretty much the seven uh, section of the stuff here. But what I understand is that it will be graded into three parts, or right? three major parts. Essentially, yes. Uh, so it's twenty percent yeah. for the presentation quality. Mm -hmm. And then 20% for requirement spec and so on, 20% for design, development, and implementation, and then 40% overall for the insights, which are 10% for technical, 10% data, 10% analytical, 10% principles of humanity. So um, you're not submitting the actual data? No, you're not doing anything. Well, I, we're not, not interested in that. You see, because if you think about how the real world works, your client, your customer, really doesn't care about what technology you use. What they want to know is that the design is sensible, that the analysis is done on sensible principles, and remember, you're probably going to know more about those anyway than most of the marketeers or other customers. And they just want to be reassured that you've done it sensibly, you've got the technical skills to do it, but they really want to know about what's the answer. So they want to use, a, you would be using a presentation like this to give them confidence that you've done the job the right way for the right reasons and that you've learned lots of lessons. And what we're mirroring is that two half brain uh, picture from SAS and the Skills UK last year, which are technical skills we take as given, because you won't be able to get the answers unless you can do the technical stuff. But we're looking at the communication, you know, things like um, curiosity, like problem identification and problem solving, collaboration if you need to work with other people to develop some of the skills. Uh, but then it's a communication and the way that you tell the story. And we're really using the soft skills mechanisms 
as a way of driving those skills, which are often not covered by most university courses. But we're trying to do that so that you really get the soft skills which you, that employers really, really want, that make you stand out from all the rest of your, the applicants who have all the same technical skills. You all know how to use SAS or Bluemix or or, or or. But this is how you stand out by having those communication, storytelling, communication, collaboration, inquisitiveness, critical thinking, critical analysis. These are things that are really, really important. So that's why we're actually set doing the assessment of this one this way around. Anything more, guys? Uh, yeah, I'm really interested in this method because it's, it's, uh, it looks simple, but it's not. Uh, it's like the real world. Yeah. It's just like how you three guys worked when you were back home. Uh, in, in the business. Your bosses assume you could do the technical job, but then they want you to communicate properly. And I was talking to a very senior IBM uh, manager uh, on the way back from Las Vegas, from the IBM conference, and she said one of the problems in business is that mo most of the IT man middle and senior management can't communicate. And so we're trying to make sure you can. Okay. Oh, we'll have further information on the, on the, on the ninth slide. Okay. Oh, we'll, we'll, next week we'll have another sort of session so we can actually help develop things and so on. And so by then, maybe you will have already laid out some of the basics of your presentation. But have a commentary on it, of course, because you add that near the la nearly the last minute. I mean, if was something we don't, yeah, we don't. Well, you know, I mean, one of the simplest approaches would be to do what um, Ross showed, which is connecting Twitter to no bread. Yeah, or connecting Twitter into some of the cognitive stuff. So that you can you find an interesting hashtag or two, and then see what's going on, do a bit of sentiment analysis. This doesn't work from the first. I tried another application which analyzing the data, which which called Kaplan. Then I take data from from organization, then I start analyzing by this uh, type tool. And I start more seeing it by many different ways. And I print my laptop today to show you what I did. Okay, right, a little bit later on then, yeah. Okay, anything more? Um, yeah. We just hope Ross comes around because if he does it, might be really uh, hard to do some of these things, to be honest. Well, what you need to do <laughs> is, as will happen when you get out there, there won't be many training courses. Although IBM have lots of training courses, most of the companies you go to won't be able to afford them. So if you go to an SME, what will happen is you've got this fabulous tool set, and then you know that you can go to Bluetooth or you can go to the IBM. Tr I mean, there's lots and lots of. If you go onto the Blue Mix area um, and also the areas around it, um, not actually about Blue Mix, but about how to use it, there are lots and lots and lots of training courses and presentations, and you'll probably find out there on YouTube huge amounts of stuff about how to do it. Because that's what you're going to be doing. And as Dennis and I go and talk to our students who are up in their placement year, most of them are using online, un, you, might, you might call unofficial sources, to find out how to do this or that or the other. Yes, they get some support from their, the other people around them in the, in the com small companies, but mostly they have to go and find YouTube or the discussion boards or the blogs or whatever to find out how to solve their problems. So again, it's got to, you, in, this is going to mirror this sort of approach. Yeah, um, we'll have to have a little think about how the timing goes because it's from end of next week is the end of term and so it's kind of a little bit tricky over Christmas because I'm, I'm assuming that neither I nor Dennis will be looking at our internet um, between the beginning of sort of Christmas Eve and the end of the following week. 
because we probably might not be might not be at home. I shan't be at home. I should be somewhere else. Up, up until the third of uh, January, I'm going to be out, away, not not ex not able to get hold of my emails at all. So I would be have like idea for you. If you keep it uh, for January uh, to send to your email and get the feedback and. Uh, well, as I say, it's a little bit tricky. If we hold to the 4th of January, but Dennis and I need to have another little discussion on this one. Um, but even if we said the 4th of January is the, uh, fee um, the, the feedback submission, and then the next week was the, on the, on the next Sunday, the 11th, was the final submission. That's again very, very tight. So you know how formative feedback works, you know the sort of things that we say. And so for this one, I think it's probably better. As a starting point, we'll have to see how it goes, but as a starting point, um, that for this, what, this particular part, you've had the formative feedback on the article last week. So maybe you should be able to do, knowing about how to communicate and set out your story, how to structure it, you ought to be able to carry that from the article into the structuring of your presentation, would be my suggestion. Is there something about uh, having a guideline how to put your voice over the presentation? If you go into YouTube and look for adding voice to... Oh, so it's YouTube. I mean, it, it should be on YouTube. In fact, you see, if you actually look at PowerPoint, let's use that one for the sake of... If you go to slideshow, and then it says record slideshow there. Uh -huh. As long as you've got a microphone plugged in, that should then work it. But if you just look for YouTube, you'll find lo almost certainly find loads of people telling you how to do it. And if you look at the help system here, it'll also tell you how to uh, do the voice, adding the voice the commentary. It should be fair enough, it should be easy. Yeah, it should be very easy. Yeah. So will be uh, each slide, uh, one uh, record or? Find out how it works. Oh. You're doing research for me. <laughs> you just may or may not know. Yeah, these are sort of things. That, why should I teach you? I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a commentary from um, the workshop I was involved in in, in Vegas. The, one of like, the colleagues there, a fairly senior um, academic professor, was pointing out that you know, it's becoming impossible for lecturers to stay on top of every single package we teach. We have, what we need to do, he was saying, and I was agreeing with him, we need to understand the broad capabilities like Dennis and I now kind of understand, like you do, what each of the, or some of the Blue Mix product set does. And then you guys have to go and decide which of 100 products in Blue Mix you want to use and learn how to use it learn what its features are that make allow it to do the things. The same goes with this. There are all sorts of things. I mean, the way that Microsoft have developed um, Office products, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and all the other products set within Office, over the last 20 odd years that it's been alive, they have added more and more and more and more functionality. And most people only use about 5% of the functionality of any of those, systems, those products. But we all use different parts because we have different interests, different needs. And when we go about, go and want to use something, we know what we want to achieve, so we then have to find out how to do it. And that's again part of being able to learn for life. Things are changing so fast that what, what's true today, what works today, what doesn't work tomorrow. Think about what Ross was saying in his first visit. It worked one night, what, the night before he was here in the hotel while he was over there, and then something changed, they added a new functionality, and it broke. Yeah. Or it worked differently. And so we just have to cope with that. It's something that's going to happen to us more and more and more. And when Dennis and I learned, I don't know, business systems analysis donkeys years ago, that was it. You didn't need to know anything, change anything really for the next five, ten years. Today, six months, three months. So we're preparing you for the real world. Especially with IT where it's yeah. constantly changing. Constantly changing, constantly changing.
Okay, now I need to hand over to uh, Dennis. Yeah, we don't know everything about everything, but we know how to find out what we don't know. That's a good one, and then how to find out from what we don't know, what we need to know. And so that we're not teaching you the subject, but we're teaching you how to learn about the subject. So, yeah. Right, um, so I think I'd like to do my sort of formal session then. Um, can you get up, open up in PowerPoint the two slide packs, the two slide decks? Um, this one, Storytelling with Data. And they're both in course resources, so you can just go back to the course resource page for this week. go to week 11 here, you will see that there's quite a few uh, resources in there. So I'd like you to open up in PowerPoint this one and this one. Okay. We're going to use this one to start with, and I'm going to switch to the other one about halfway through and then go back to the first. So we'll see if we can cope with that with the technology. Okay. So have you got those two up? Yeah. Just, just open those two slides slide sequences in um, PowerPoint. This one here and on this one. Okay. Are they both still on for me? They should be on the first side of them. Okay, so um, I when I was researching this I was really getting quite excited about the things I found and hopefully it'll uh, be interested as well. So we're looking at something called storytelling and Richard had mentioned earlier on that it's okay we might be able to find a big data source, we might do some analysis on it, we might produce some nice visualizations but at the end of the day we need to say well okay so what? So what's the so what? What does this data show? How do we interpret it through the visualization to provide some kind of insight into something or call for action to change something or some impact from the data. So it's, it's an important part of the whole process. So it's been said by this particular article I found, storytelling is the last mile in big data analysis and analytics. It's that final conclusion. What have we found out from this data? What action can we take? What is the insight? So what's the so what? You know. And <coughs> Again, just to emphasize, it's becoming more and more emphasized in, in the data analytics world that this end point or this final part of the, the process is becoming very important. And this is a sort of a, um, a, substantial, uh, a substantiation of that, arguing that um, we need analytic skills, but also collaboration, written or oral, oral communication, like Richard was saying earlier on, and business savvy. We need to have a business focus as well. So there are growing moves and, and impetus towards this being able to produce, do this endpoint of the storytelling part as well as the analysis. So in very simple terms, this is the full, the full picture of guy. So this is a very simple example. Probably a good idea if you're following through this on your, on your course resource pages as well because you'll be able to see the screens that bit clearer. So follow through the slides. On, on, the, on, on your screens you can do. So this is a very simple example. We have some kind of, imagine a, a, a company that's got retail outlets over some region or other, maybe in the States possibly, and they have uh, eight or nine or ten stores and they're selling different products. And they want to know how their business is, is going. We want to track how the business is operating. And so like, you can produce some raw data, you can have a spreadsheet with your stores, one to ten stores, and the weekly sales figures for those stores across the uh, in the spreadsheet. So you've got stores here, and then the weekly sales figures, and then you've got some kind of profit um, spreadsheet as well that you can derive from the original one. So January, February, March, and then the stores down here. So you might have a spreadsheet which shows you the the monthly profits for the stores. So a business might have this kind of raw data, if you like. And then we can visualize that. We can put it in a graph here and plot, it's difficult to see on the screen, and plot um, how, so we've got the stores along the bottom here. And for each of these bar chart <coughs> graphs here is a particular product. 
they call them um, they call them units. Unit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the the stores are selling several different kinds of items, and the graph here shows the the sales for each of these items against the stores. It's difficult, a little bit difficult to spot the trend, but if we look at um, item six and store store nine here, so store nine, their item six here, this second to the left, what second to the right one here, it isn't selling as much as the others. So we say, okay, so what? What can we do about it? What what conclusion can we draw? So a, a conclusion, if you like, is is stated here that um, the manager might say, based on this, um, the, 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 anal the analysis, the an analyst might say, based on these figures and this visualization, this is the end result, this is what we need to do, this is the call for action that we need to make based on the data and the visualization we've got. So they're saying that store nine can improve its sales of item six if it follows the same sales techniques that the other stores are using and they've been tried and tested techniques. So they're saying that this product is not selling very well here, there's no reason why it shouldn't, and they're saying the end of the story is that store needs to do this, that and the other, and it'll improve, it'll improve its uh, sales. So that's a very simple example of getting the raw data, doing some visualisation, and then coming to some kind of uh, end of the story sequence here, what we're we, we going to do next. And uh, this, is, this is a reference to it here, this is where I've got information. So that's a very simple example to set the scene if you like. And I, one of the a growing leading light in this idea of, of the storytelling side of, of analytics in terms of presenting visualizations that are communicating um, a clear analysis of the data and then making some conclusions from it is this girl woman called Cole, I don't know how to pronounce it, Nusbama Nathalie. And she's becoming she seems to be becoming very um, prominent in, in this area. And she's just brought a book out, Storytelling with Data. I've ordered some copies, I've ordered a copy for the library. Um, but I suggest if you are very much interested in this, that you um, have a look at this and consider it fresh for you. Because, as I say, she does seem to be driving this topic forward and producing published works based on her expertise and, and, and practice. She, she worked for Google for 10 years or so. And, and she's using her expertise from that work at Google to, um, to, to um, develop the <coughs> techniques that she's been looking at. So she's got quite a lot of, um, I've put quite a lot of links in here. This is her website for her company now that she runs. We'll have a look at this in more detail. She's also put in, there are other links to other talks and articles that she's written. And in your guided independent study time, do follow these up and explore them because they are very interesting. And this one here, Death to Pie Charts. Okay. She presents some quite um, uh, well argued reasons for not using it. A lot of the stuff she's talking about, she's standing on Edward Tuft's shoulders. Remember Edward Tuft mentioned a couple weeks ago visualization, very, very um, uh, respected, influential person doing visualizations. She's sort of moving his work into the computing age, if you like, much more based on digital media rather than his print. What I want to do particularly, so do explore these, they are very good sources of, of information, but I want to look in detail about this talk that she did at Google. Now the first bit is about nearly 30 minutes, the whole of it is 53, I'm not going to go through all 53, but I want to look at the first half an hour in some detail. She introduces some exercises for the audience and we're going to do exactly the same thing that she does through this, through this, through the video. And then I want to go back to her examples and just go through them again because they are very enlightening in terms of the communicating your story. So, we're going to have half an hour with Cole, if not longer. And I'm going to turn the light up as well so you can see this better. Can we see all that? Yes, we can. Please join me in welcoming uh, Cole Newsbomber Netflix, uh, Storytelling with Data um, for Authors app. Uh, 
Um, Cole was on our team, People Analytics and People Operations here at Google, many, many years ago, and she led our relationship with sales. And she was known throughout the team for her incredible expertise with presenting data, visualizing data, and making it actually speak to clients and to users. Um, and lots of funny stories about Cole, but one that stands out um, is her feelings on pie charts. Um, I put together an analysis once that showed her distribution of a, a specific population by level or something, put it in a beautiful pie chart that I thought was amazing, and Cole gave me very brutally honest feedback about how ineffective it was at actually showing the differences in the group. So, Cole, I'm very curious to hear today if you still have those views on pie charts or if maybe they're a little bit more acceptable now. I still have a pretty strong view when it comes to pie charts. Okay. Well, we'll we look forward to hearing a little bit more about that. Um, so the way that this is going to work is we're going to have 30 minutes of a lesson, actually, from Cole from her book. Um, and then second, we're going to have Q&A moderated by Tina Malm from People Analytics and me, Davey Nichols, from People Analytics as well. So please, again, join me in welcoming Cole to her first stop on her book tour here at Google. So it seems so fitting for me for Google to be the first stop after the official publication of my book, since this is where so much of it began. I started at Google back in 2007 on the People Analytics team. And People Analytics is an analytical team in the People Ops organization here, where the goal is to try to ensure that all the decisions about people, employees, future employees, are data driven. Now, I had the opportunity of joining when the team was relatively small, which meant that I got to work on a ton of cool stuff over the years, learning about things like what makes a manager effective, how do you build productive teams, what drives attrition. Now, in 2010, we developed a program called Basecamp. It was an internal MBA-like training program within people operations. And I was asked to build content on data visualization which was an awesome opportunity, because I'd always been really interested in this space. But this meant I could pause and research and understand why some of the things I'd arrived at through trial and error over time had been effective. So as a side note, I can honestly say that Google, for me, was life-changing. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, but the very first time I delivered the data visualization course, which was in, at a people ops offsite in Monterey, in the very first row sat my future husband. Uh, so you could really say, without the data visualization course here at Google, I wouldn't have these. Or the third, that's on the way. Uh, super life changing. But back on Google, uh, there was broader interest we were finding in the data visualization course. So we actually ended up rolling it out across Google, which meant I got the opportunity to travel to offices in London and Dublin and Zurich and train trainers and uh, teach courses. I uh, also got a chance to teach courses across a number of U.S. offices, including many right here in Mountain View. One of the things that was interesting for me was to see salespeople and engineers sitting side by side in those courses. came to realize that the skills needed in this area were fundamental. Uh, they weren't specific to any given role. They also weren't specific to Google. Over time, other organizations started reaching out to me, wanting me to go teach their teams and their organizations how to communicate effectively with data. So over the course of the past couple of years, I've had the opportunity to work with hundreds of different teams across many different organizations. And usually this takes the form of workshops, where I'll spend half a day or a full day teaching foundational lessons on communicating with data. And oftentimes what I'll do is solicit examples from the group ahead of time. And we'll go through the lessons and then we'll spend time talking about that group's specific examples. And I'll go through my makeovers as one potential path that leverages the lessons that we've covered. So I thought it might be cool to take you through a couple of these. We won't go through them in a lot of detail, but just give you a visual sense of what you can learn in the book. So this first example is one from the philanthropic sector. This was a foundation that wanted to start a conversation on shifting spending from non-initiative, which is the big sort of cream-colored segment at the top left, to higher education, that tiny blue segment. So in this case, we change from the pie chart, if I already talked about my views there, to this. Right? If we want to shift spending, let's say we want to shift spending and start a conversation about that. Use visual cues to draw our audience's attention to where we want them to pay. Let's look at another example. So this is one from an IT group who couldn't believe that people, after looking at this graph, weren't doing anything with this information. 
Why weren't they acting upon this information? Here it gets totally lost in the graph, right? There's no story to bring it to life. Now the backstory was, if we, if we stare at this long enough, we can see there's a gap starting to form out on the right-hand side, where the number of tickets coming in are exceeding the number that are being processed. Now the backstory was they lost a couple of resources, they were understaffed, and they really wanted to hire a couple more people. And they couldn't understand why nobody was doing that based on this graph. So in this case, we change from that to this. Again. Okay, I'll just pause that slightly. Do you understand what tickets are? It's, um, you know, on an IT help desk. Yeah, they get like a quick. You get a, you get a ticket, you get a, a, um, a help call or whatever, and they have to log it as a ticket, and then somebody picks it up, and then they go and solve the problem, and then they, they, uh, resolve, yeah, they resolve the ticket. So, let's say she does go through the slides quite quickly. I'm going to go back through them again, but just to compare the bar chart with this different way of representing the same data to get the message over. Okay, so they lost two employees in May, and since then they've had more tickets in that they've been able to to actually process. So in other words, the help desk has been overloaded and they've been able to, to respond to the to the to the people in time. Okay, so that's that's the message. That's the so what we're coming out of this. Okay, I'm gonna pause slightly one or two others. Let's go, let's continue. Making that call to action clear, annotating the context directly on the graph, drawing attention to that gap that's forming on the right-hand side. So I got one more of these. This is an example uh, from a small organization who was recognizing that their regional sales competition had shifted over time and wanting to have a conversation. I'll just pause slightly there so you can take that graph in, okay, because it does go very fast. So it's a bar chart. Here with region A, B, C, D, and then the others, and then there's two lines, one from December 09, another one from December 11, and then you've got these things here, which I haven't got a clue what these are. Annualized growth rate, so they're saying essentially growth per over the over the last 12 months. And then there's a section here. There's a couple of comments here. Regions A, B, and C continue to have to have the highest sales. And so just 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 store that in that image in your mind, and then we'll have a look at the next one. So I'm fine. I'll play again about what some of the implications of that were. Now, this is an interesting one. I've used this a number of times in workshops. And when people flip to this graph, there's often a sort of immediate negative visceral reaction, uh, which is something we want to try to avoid in our audiences. And now, I can't imagine all of them were Packers fans, like my husband. These are sort of Broncos colors, right? Um, but rather, that this graph was unnecessarily confusing. Now the beautiful thing here is there are some clear takeaways articulated at the bottom. It's just almost impossible to know where to look in the data for evidence of those takeaways. So in this case, changed from that to this, making the focus on the change. Okay, can I just pause that slightly so you can take it in and compare it with the others. She does, we're going to go back through this again. Where you can see how the, the date, it's the same data, but it's, it's visualized in a completely different way to get the message across so you can pick out the so what, if you like. And then there's a, the other thing is they've got the same comments down here. Um, so this is then basically the storytelling. You have the, you have the data represented in this kind of visualization, and then you've got some comments relating to it on this side. Okay. And then there's a sort of a, a takeaway at the bottom, as she calls it. You know, what are the implications of the changes in, in um, some of these sales, like A going down, for example, and things like that. Okay. So just. Sort of visualize that difference again. She's going to explain it again. So I'm just pausing so you get that sense of it because they do move quite quickly. Each time the text directly through to the data, both through proximity and similarity of color. Now, one thing to note is these examples they cross many different industries. I mentioned before, these skills they're not role specific, they're also not really industry specific. Um, rather, they're foundational, and over time, through all of the workshops that I've taught over the past few years, I've codified these lessons, and that's what ultimately led to this, my book. Uh, and I'm super excited to be able to share with you today a couple quick lessons from my new book, Storytelling with Data. So we're going to talk today about two key lessons. First off, focusing attention, and secondly, telling a story. I want to draw one important distinction at this point, which is the distinction between <coughs> exploratory analysis and explanatory analysis. So exploratory analysis, you perhaps start off with a question or a hypothesis, or you're just digging through your data, trying to understand what's interesting, what can I learn about this data 
that somebody else might care about. Once you've identified that interesting thing, then we move into explanatory space. That is where you have something specific you want to communicate to somebody specific. It's this latter space we want to keep in mind uh, today. And when it comes to explanatory analysis, these lessons become more important than perhaps any others. First off, thinking about where you want your audience to pay attention and doing uh, things on purpose to make that happen. And then secondly, never simply showing data, but rather making data a pivotal point in an overarching story. So we'll talk briefly through each of these. First off, focusing attention. I can recall a time at Google where I was working on the Project Oxygen study. Quick show of hands, how many people are familiar with Project Oxygen? Most people in the room. So Project Oxygen was a study led by my colleague Neil Patel. And the goal really was to try to understand on a mathematical, a statistical level, what makes managers effective. One of the challenges that we encountered was, after the study was done, communicating the results of it to a very mixed audience, where we had both engineers who had a great desire for detail. They wanted to understand the methodology, they wanted to be convinced of the robustness of the analysis. At the same time, we were also wanting to communicate to sales managers, for example, who were mostly less concerned with methodology and more concerned about what's in it for me. How should I act differently based on this? And so what we found was, by really being careful about how we focused attention, we could preserve a lot of that detail but push it to the background and make the meta point pop out so that it was clear. Let's talk a little bit about how people see to get into more of this how we focus attention. So here's a super simplified picture of that process. On the left hand side, you have light refracting off a stimulus. It gets captured by our eyes. We don't fully see with our eyes. Rather, most of what we think of as visual processing takes place in our brains. Now, in the brains, there are a few types of memory that are important to understand as we're designing visual communications. So I've got one of them today, which is iconic memory. Iconic memory is super short term. It's shorter than short term memory, and information stays there for fractions of a second before it gets forwarded onto our short term memory. I'm going to pause there slightly. I don't think any of you have done my second year module, but in my second year module, we also, we also talk about iconic memory, short term memory, and long term memory. So there's some links going back into there. But I, I don't think any of you have done it. There you go, no matter. So there's a link here, you see. That's product design. IT yeah. product design, yes. There's a link going back. The really cool thing about iconic memory is that it's tuned to a specific set of what we call pre-attentive attributes. So let's actually pause here and do a quick exercise. So in a moment, I'm going to put a bunch of numbers up on the screen. What I'd like you all to do, as fast as you can, is count the number of threes that you see. We got it ready to threes. When you know the answer, shout it out. It is a race you would like to win. Ready, set, go. Okay, how many threes? Say three, didn't you? Six. 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 Okay, six, right. Good. All right, six is the correct answer. This took a bit of time, though, right? You physically read through these four lines of text. Look for three, which is kind of a complicated shape. Watch what a different exercise it becomes when I make one tiny change. Don't have time to think, don't have time to blink, suddenly there are six threes in front of you. This is so apparent so quickly because I'm leveraging your iconic memory. I'm using the pre-attentive attribute of intensity of color in this case to make the threes the one thing that stand out as different from the rest. Now this is hugely critical because what this means is our pre-attentive attributes, if we use them strategically, can help enable us to get our audience to see what we want them to see before they even know that they're seeing it. Here are the attributes. I won't. Okay, this is a bit of more psychology here. Uh, the, um, the, one of the PDFs in your course resources has got this one as well. Uh, we don't need to worry too much about the detail of this, but it, she is using psychological principles to, to illustrate some of the things she's doing here. So this, the, the copy of this is in the uh, course resource pages. Read through all of these, but notice as your eyes scan across the screen how they're just drawn to the one within each group that's different from the rest. You don't really have to consciously look for it. Now, one thing to know about the attributes is people tend to associate quantitative values with some, but not others. 
For example, most people will consider a long line to represent a greater value than a short line. It's one of the reasons uh, bar charts are intuitive for us to read. But we don't think of hue, for example, in the same way. If I ask you which is greater, red or blue, it's not really a meaningful question. And this is important because it tells us which of the attributes can be used to encode quantitative information and which should be used as categorical differentiators. Now, as you can perhaps imagine, pre-attentive attributes become huge tools for focusing our audience's attention when it comes to visualizing data. So here's some sort of generic data from our annual cup. Okay, I'll just, I'll just pause slightly so we can just get a sense of the nature of that. Of that. So there's bar charts there, different lines. She said, you know, we, we represent long, higher quantities, larger quantities with longer lines. So we've got the um, customer survey results. 30 up to 90%. Just get a sense of that illustration there. Customer survey. We can see how we've fared across a number of dimensions. Notice how, without other visual cues, it becomes very much like the count the threes example again. We have to look at this data, read through it, figure out what might be important to pay attention to. Whereas if I'm the one communicating this data, I should have already done that for you. In which case, I can use some pre-attentive attributes, perhaps paired with some explanatory text, to draw your attention very quickly to one part of the story. Right? Price and convenience, we're doing... Okay, again, just pause there slightly so you can see the highlight of the top two. Because that's where you want the focus to be, your attention. And they've actually, she's actually linked the colour of the text with the, the bar as well to draw your attention to that particular part of the, the uh, visualisation, if you like. Awesome here, let's pause and celebrate our success. Or I can use the same broad strategy to draw your attention, totally different place in the data. Okay, so it's now highlighting the bottom two. And again, using, actually linking it together with the colours. So it's now highlighting the impact or the sort of... <laughs> implications of these two results of these uh, criteria here. You can see how you make an attention change between the different parts of the visualization to get whatever message you want across. But well, we're struggling when it comes to relationship and brand. How can we positively impact these areas? Now, there's a test I like to employ in trying to figure out whether you're using your pre-attentive attributes strategically. And that is the where are your eyes drawn test, where you look away from your visual and look back at it, or close your eyes and look back at it, and just notice where your eyes land first. Because it's probably where your audience's eyes will land as well. So I thought we'd do this with a series of pictures uh, and just talk about the implications for our visual designs. So I'm going to put a series of different pictures up there. When I put the picture up, just shout out where your eyes go first. Ready? Where do your eyes go first? Here. Stop. 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 Why? The others are fairly small. Stop second, right? You almost can't look anywhere else at the onset because it's bright, it's red, it's got these big bold capital letters, it's outlined in white which sets it apart from the background. When I think about how you can use some of those cues when you're visualizing data to draw attention as well. Let's do another one. Where do your eyes go here? they go to the sun. But if you're like me, when you try to look at the sun, you get this plane sort of tugging on your peripheral vision. Or if I try to look at the plane, I can see the sun sort of wanting to pull me that way. So just be aware that when you're emphasizing multiple things in a graph or on a page, this tension that can be created in your audience. How about where your eyes go here? Everywhere and nowhere. Yeah, ends up on peripheral. Yeah, probably in the middle, yeah. It depends a little bit perhaps on where you're sitting in the room. A lot of people will be drawn to that perennial sail sign in bright pink because it's bright because of the black bold lettering on it. And then most people from there will continue down and rightward. And that's because without other visual cues, we typically start at the top left of our page or our screen and do zigzagging Z's across. So in this case, that draw to the perennial sail was strong. So we started there and then continued <coughs> on that Z downward and to the right. 
Notice that means we missed whatever was happening in the top left quadrant, and maybe that second and third quadrant as well. So to be thoughtful about the overarching designs of the pages on which your data visualization sits and take that into account. Just a couple more of these. Where do your eyes go? Here. No particular focus, is there? You're sort of scanning and touching yeah. backwards and forwards, trying to, trying to focus on somewhere, but there's a lot of other distractions. Uh, everywhere and nowhere, all at the same time! Right? Colorful is an awesome goal for a birthday party. Did you hear that? Colour is an awesome goal for a birthday party. Mm -hmm. Okay, just, just pause on that. <laughs> Colour is not such an awesome goal when it comes to visualising data. Did you hear that? Not such an awesome goal when you visualize it. When we make so many things different, we have a lot of stuff competing for our attention, which actually makes it really hard to look at any one thing. Check out the difference in how your attention is uh, focused here versus here. Right? It's like the graph earlier on, when we highlighted in blue and bits and then red in the other. With the red balloon, the one thing that's different on the whole page, we almost can't not look at it. That is the power of color, specifically used strategically. Let's take a look now at an example from that Project Oxygen study that I mentioned at the onset. This is what one of our... Okay, just, again, just pause on that because it just goes quite quickly. So, lots of color. You don't really know where to look or what the message is. Yeah. So what's the so what? What, what are we trying to pick out from this graph, this, this visualization? our original slides looked like. It's been genericized a bit. We can see our main takeaway at the top. Some elements of job satisfaction are more sensitive to manager quality than others. We've got some categorizations here and then our data at the bottom. Here we're not using color so strategically. Here color is used as a categorical differentiator. They're originally, we've taken them off here, but we're categories along the bottom. You can think of those like Google Guys categories, things like career development and performance management and culture which is not necessarily how we want to be using our color. So in this case, our redesign looked like this. The graph's most... Okay, it's the same, same graph, but using different, well, sort of quite, not strong color groups, I mean, but there's only three different colors there. A dark blue, a lighter blue, and then a, a grayish one to highlight the particular conclusions they want to draw from the, from the, from the data. The end of the story, if you like. the same. The contents of the page are pretty much exactly the same. We've just rearranged things a bit and used our pre-attentive attributes, color specifically, more thoughtfully to really draw our audience's attention to where we want them to pay. While we draw attention, we also want to think about embedding our data in story. So by way of a Google anecdote, I can recall a time when I was working with one of the junior analysts on our team. And she had just finished analyzing Google Guest results, results from the annual employee survey for a given part of the organization, and was getting ready to communicate those results to the leader of that team. And this particular team had been struggling in a lot of places. The scores weren't great, so there was some sensitivity around how that message should be delivered. And the deck at that point was page after page after page of the standard report. No story and little narrative to tie it all together would have been very easy for the leader of that group to say, oh, that's interesting, and move on to the next thing. That would have been a failure. So what I had the analyst do was set the deck aside and tell me the story. Tell me what you learned when you were analyzing this data. And when we did that, the articulation of the story was super powerful. There were clear areas for improvement, and she knew exactly where to focus action to achieve that improvement. This we could use to light a fire under the leader for that team. So it's a good example of how data without story isn't always so meaningful, but the story can help bring the data to life. So when I think about how we can leverage that power when we are communicating with data every time we're doing it. Here are... Right, okay. I'll look at this. What's, what's the story? What's, what's the Do you recognize the... Um,
That's one way of representing the story. Okay. Some facts on a slide. Go ahead and read through these. Anybody recognize what we're looking at here? What story is this? Red Riding Hood. Right? But facts on a slide are not so compelling or memorable. If I ask you a day or two from now, what distance was it from Red Riding Hood's house to Grandma's? Or what time did Red Riding Hood get there? These aren't likely facts that you will have committed to your memory. Stories, on the other hand, are memorable. So how many people, quick show of hands, know the story of Red Riding Hood? Pretty much everybody in the room. We'll do a quick thought exercise here. We'll just take about 15 seconds. Close your eyes or stare up at this screen, and I'd like you to recall for yourself the story of Red Riding Hood, thinking specifically about the plot, the twists, and the ending. 15 seconds here. Are you all doing that? No longer thinking. <laughs> Show of hands, how many people were able to get to the high level story? You're probably a little afraid to raise your hands at this point for fear of what might happen next. Uh, let me bear with me, I'll, I'll tell you the story that resides in my head. So, Red Riding Hood sets off, she has a basket of goodies, she's going to Grandma's. Grandma's not feeling well. And on her way, she encounters a wolf. The wolf is able to extract from her where she's going and realizes that if he's patient, he can have not only one dinner but two. So, he races ahead to Grandma's eats grandma, uh, and dresses up in her clothes, gets into her bed. Red Riding Hood arrives, and senses something is awry, and goes through a series of questioning with the wolf posing as grandma. Oh grandma, what big your, oh, how big your eyes are? Oh grandma, how big your ears are? Oh grandma, how big your teeth are? To which the wolf replies, all the better to eat you with. Uh, so wolf actually eats Red Riding Hood as well, uh, but then guy with an axe shows up. Uh, cuts open the wolf's belly, and the wolf had eaten Grandma and Red in such haste that they're fine. They come out. Um, and interestingly, if you go back to the Grimm's original, the wolf doesn't die then. They actually fill his stomach with rocks and sew him up so that when he wakes up, he drops dead. I think it's a warning story in, uh, you know, go straight where you're intended to go, don't talk to strangers, and so forth. Uh, but what does this tell us about what we're here to talk about today? So for me, stories like Red Riding Hood are evidence of a couple of things. First off is the power of repetition. When you consider it's probably been some amount of time since you've given much thought to the story of Red Riding Hood. And yet over the course of time, you've perhaps heard that story a number of times, read the story a number of times, maybe told the story a number of times. There's something that happens with that repetition of use, of hearing and saying and reading things multiple times that helps form a bridge from our short-term memory to our long-term memory. The other cool thing that stories like Red Riding Hood illustrate for us is this magical combination of plot and twists and ending that enable things to stick with us in a way that we can later recall and retell to somebody else. So when I think about how we can leverage these powerful concepts when it comes to the stories that we want to tell with our data to get those to be something our audience will remember in a way that they can later recall and retell to somebody else. So when we think about the components of the story, I want to think back to those same things that we talked about with Red Riding Hood. The plot, the twists, the ending. <coughs> the plot becomes what context is essential for your audience. What do they need to know in order to be in the right frame of mind for what you're going to tell them? Then the twists. What's interesting about the data and what it shows? By the way, if there isn't anything interesting about the data, don't show the data. You run the risk of losing your audience's attention for when you do have something important to say with it. And then finally, the ending, the call to action. What do you want your audience to do? My view is we should always want our audience to do something and we should be working to make that something as clear as possible. Because if we simply show data, as we saw in that case with the Google Guys stack, it's easy for our audience to say, oh, that's interesting, and move on to the next thing. But if we ask for action, our audience has to respond to that. And even if they disagree, it starts a conversation. And it's a conversation that may never happen if we simply show data. Let's take a look at an example. So in this scenario, imagine... 
cake and I'll pour slightly so you can just grasp the nature of the graphic the visualization. We've got two pie charts. Okay, um, it's a survey from a, a school children about um, some workshop I think that Google did. And they have a before and after perspective on how the kids have changed their views about science from going on this workshop to, to finishing. So they're looking at kids changing attitude about science before and after they go on this, this workshop. Okay. So that's the, um, the scenario. So just, just get a feel for the, the graphic that is being used. Two pie charts. In that you just wrapped up a summer learning program on science. The goal was to get kids excited about science. We have some survey data from a survey we gave before the program on the left and after the program on the right, where children who classify their interest as bored, not great, okay, kind of interested and excited. Give you a moment to take this in and then we'll talk about it. How does it feel comparing segments across two pies? Not. Did you pick that up about comparing data across two pie charts? So great, right? The only thing worse than a pie for me personally, two pies. Especially when you're trying to compare across them, because if anything changed in the data, which it should have if there's something interesting you're trying to say, the pieces are all in an entirely different place over there on the right. So you always want to think about what do you want to allow your audience to compare? How do you align those things to a common baseline and put them as close together as possible? But check out what happens if I talk you through the narrative. So going into the program, the biggest segment of students, this 40% in green, felt just okay about science. Maybe hadn't made up their minds one way or the other. Whereas after the program, a really cool thing happened. That great big 40% shrunk down to only 14%. Now, there was a little bit of movement in the negative direction. Bored and not great went up a percentage point each. But most of the movement was in the positive direction, where in after the program, nearly 70% of kids, if we add together that purple and teal segments, expressed interest towards science. This is a successful program. We should continue to offer it. Notice how, with a strong narrative, I can actually get away with a kind of crummy visual. The alternative does not hold true. I can have the most beautiful data visualization in the world, and without a compelling story to go with it, to make my audience care about it, to make it something that resonates with them, that sticks with them, I run the risk of that beautiful data visualization falling flat. So it's not to say we shouldn't spend time perfecting our data visualization, but rather to underscore the importance of story. And now nirvana in this stuff is reached when both are strong. You have a powerful story and an effective uh, visual to back it up. In this case, we could end up somewhere like this. Exposure to science. It okay, so that's the same data in the two pie charts, but now it's been merged, and you can see the uh, change between the before and after um, uh, what's that, views of the kids. So it's a much stronger outcome. The, the, the evidence is much stronger. It's presented in a much better way than two pie charts. I'll see what she's going to say. Excites kids. Bit of background, our call to action, let's keep offering this. Then we get down to the data. How do you feel about science? Beforehand, most kids tied through both color and proximity to the data point that is evidence of that point. Most kids felt okay. Whereas after the program, we get this pull to the right-hand side where kids are feeling interested, they're feeling excited about science. That's the kind of story that we want to create for our audience. That's the kind of the way we want to be able to focus attention for our audience. So those are the quick lessons I have to cover here with you today. I wanted to give you a quick sense of how they fit in with the rest of the content in the book. Okay, right. I think we'll, we'll then we've got the major points that she got across. The rest of it is selling a book, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on from there. But do you see the nature of how the visualization and the nature of the visualization, same data, but if you, you need to present it in a way where the message comes across, and then explore the message with a few bits of notes and text. If you can. What do you think of that so far? Um, I thought some really interesting basic ideas in there in terms of. In terms of okay, it's uh, 2211. 
Just, so I've listed out the chapters here. I'll just do another 15 minutes, and then we'll have a break. You've got your clicker. No, I haven't. And then we'll have a break, and we'll have a, 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 a sort of But I just want to finish off the, um, the storyline on this. So can you now go to your other pack of slides, which we opened up earlier? <coughs> that one. Okay, we have two open. So just go, just just go to that. You got that? So this, what I've done is, is take, taken shots of those, in, those individual um, uh, diagrams from the talk and put them side by side. Oh. Yeah. So, so if you go through them there, I won't explain them again because we, we, you know, we should have done it, but you can see the difference. It's the same data visualized in a much better fashion to get your message over, to get your storyline over, to get the... Um, the impact on it. Okay, so you can see the comparison between the two. And then the ticket trend thing, bar chart on this side, but if it represents it in a different way, the, the message is clear yeah. that the number of tickets received is greater than the ones that were processed. So they need more staff. That doesn't come across very so easily in this way of representing the data. And then the regional sales one again, initially using a bar chart, but if you represent the data in a different form, a different visualization, and add the notes in connected, which is used using the the um, the colours here to link with the, the lines as well between the text and the graph to, to make the connection between the two. Yeah. And then the survey one again, just using the subtle colours, nothing extravagant. Just highlighting the areas that they want the message to get across in terms of things that are going very well and things that are not that need attention. And again, the job satisfaction one, it's very difficult to see from this what's going on in there, but if you use these highlighters and the colours much more carefully, you get the message across much more clearly as to what's going on inside all that data. And again, this is, I think this is extremely powerful comparison between the two pie charts and then drawing it out in this, this way with the bar charts and you can see the, um, the change in the, um, the survey data. I think that's very, very clear. So you get the message across much more clearly in, in this bar chart version. Okay. So let's move back to the... Um, Let's go back to the main, the main set of slides then, and I'll finish off fairly swiftly now. So, as you can see, Cole, used by Lynn Netflix, has got some really good ideas, and she's done some lot of other stuff, um, including a book, which um, I say is on order, which will come in the library probably by after Christmas or so, and do have a look at the other things she's been talking about. It's really interesting ideas that she's got. Somebody else that is also quite influential in this area and done some interesting stuff is a guy called Simon Rogers. Calls himself a data journalist. And we've had come across a couple of other data journalists, David McCandless a couple of weeks ago as well. Using data, big data sometimes, to create stories, these are you know, sort of journalist type stories. And again, there's a nice video here. It's about 10, 12, 10 minutes or so. And he's basically saying that you don't need to be an expert in analytics or um, technology, technology stuff when there are all sorts of tools. Tableau we covered a couple of weeks ago. There are all sorts of tools you can use to process your data and represent it in, 
interesting ways. So that's his basic message. You know, there's lots of tools available to, for us to use to, to create these um, stories. How, oh, I think, yeah. Let's have a look at um, his website just briefly. So this is his website here. And he's got a blog here where he's... Um, latest stories, he's publishing his latest stories and, and how he's used data to generate the stories. Remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about the refugee situation. Mm -hmm. He's done exactly something, well not similar exactly, but he's, he's taken, um, used some data sets for these, uh, this project and written and used it to do some analysis and then produce some stories. So it's interesting that he's using um, topics that we covered uh, a couple of weeks ago. And very interesting stuff in here uh, to look at and explore um, in terms of uh, telling stories with data. And again, somebody else, Ben Wellington, an American um, academic teachers at um, um, a local institute in New York. Again, um, what time is it? I don't think I'll go through these videos now. But this one here is well worth, well both of them were worth looking at to, um, to see how he's used data to tell stories and then some action has resulted from that and the way he's presented it to get the results that he wants. Um, and he's also um, uses a, I'll just we'll go in here though very quickly. He's using an open data source from New York City, I don't know if you found this yourselves. But there's a whole, whole, whole um, number of open data sources here that he uses in his work. So that's interesting stuff there as well. And then we covered Tableau a couple of weeks ago. Tableau introduced a Tableau analysis, free um, analysis uh, software. And they've got, they've got a particular feature in here called Story Points, where you can do similar things to what we just saw in the video in terms of putting data up and then having a text and things around it to explain what's going on. So, and he's used a couple of examples about some stories that have, is ex that have been explored used in terms of um, exploring um, high turnover rates in Austin, Texas in terms of teachers, they're offering a lot of money to stay in these um, poor underachieving schools but it's still not helping any. And there are a couple of other examples of how um, of data, anal data analysis and storytelling, if you like, on these different topics here, using this feature of Tableau called Story Points. Um, so that's another interesting place to have a look at as well. So the analytics packages are putting in tools you can use to, to link data and stories together, a bit like we saw earlier on in the video. So lots of places to go for more interesting things. Okay, um, that's the, to summarise then, there are lots of references and course resources to go to and explore these things we've been talking about um, in terms of storytelling and, and following up on a lot of the things that uh, Cole Nussmaller Nathalik was talking about in her, in her um, techniques you can use in her. Okay, before I start you off on the uh, exercise then, is there any particular questions, queries, puzzles about what we've been just been looking at? I think it's very interesting the way the message gets across in terms of the right visualisation. I think that's really something to think about very carefully in the work you're doing. Right, so I say we're going to finish at half... 12 today because I need to get off up to a meeting in Sheffield. So um, I've got a, I'll give you a second off on the research activity. You've got a chance for a break and then we'll, re we'll have some feedback about about an hour's time actually, quarter to 12. Let's see how you get on with this. Well, the results of your research activity. So what I want you to do, working in twos, threes, probably two or two or three possibly, or, or whatever, however you choose it, uh, we've looked at 
store Italian data. So what I'd like you to do is have a look around, do some research, and see if you can find somewhere on the web or even elsewhere some an example of storytelling with big data. Some research activity, some exercise that's been carried out using big data, analysing it, presenting some kind of visualisation, and then some kind of storyline or some kind of story out of it. And I'll, see, I'll see, see if you can find an example of how that's been done by somebody somewhere. And you might be able to dig around some of the stuff you know, people have talked about, and maybe something in the way in their work, or some other people as well. I'd like to have a go and see if you can find an example of what we've been trying to talk about. Analyzing big data, producing some kind of visualization, and then some kind of storyline emerging from that as to what that visual says. So what's the so what from doing all that work? What's the, what's the data source? What tools did they use? What visualization did they do? What is the end result? What is the impact? What's the, the light bulb moment after doing all that work? See if you can find an example somewhere. Okay. Again, record it, make some notes, slide. So not to not worry about the quality of the slide particularly. Get it down and post it in the group area and we'll have a look at them in an hour's time, see what you found. Okay. Any questions about that?